So today we're going to be talking about love. Um, what is love? Where does love come from? How do we understand love? And so when we, um, oh, let me make sure I did all my stuff right. Okay. So when we start talking about love, um, everybody likes to be loved. I'm pretty sure there isn't anybody that doesn't like being loved. But not everybody likes loving. Loving is a lot harder than being loved. Because when we define love, when we're, when we're talking about agape love, the pure love, the, the divine love, it's, it's other-centered, self-giving. So we all like being loved because we all like being centered, and we all like being given to. Not all of us like focusing on somebody else and giving and sacrificing for the other. So that's why it's hard sometimes to love others. It's, it's, it's easy to be loved. Sure, just give me. Focus all your attention on me and give me stuff. That's great. I like that part. But when, it, when you have to flip that switch um, and love in return, it's not always the most easy thing to do. Okay? So uh, we want to talk a lot about it. What is it? Where does it come from? How do we understand it? And so to begin with, we're going to start in 1 Corinthians 13. Paul talks about love. Paul defines love. Paul says what love is. And so in verse 4, he says, Love is patient. Love is kind and it is not jealous. Love does not brag and is not arrogant. Love does not act unbecomingly. It does not seek his own. Love is not provoked and does not take into account a wrong suffered. Keep in mind, remember, hear that, hear that. Love does not take into account a wrong suffered. Okay? Remember that. Keep that in mind. Um, love does not rejoice in unrighteousness, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never fails. Okay? Love never fails. Love is patient. Love is kind. We like love. Where am I going now? Oh, now I remember. If I forget, it's on the wall there. First John 4. Start verse 7. Beloved, let us love one another. For love is from God, and everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. The one who does not love does not know God, for God is love. By this the love of God was manifest in us, that God has sent His Son, or His only begotten Son, into the world, so that we might live through Him. In this is love. Not that we loved God, but that He loved us and sent his, sent his Son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has seen God at any time. If we love one another, God abides in us and His love is perfected in us. Okay, so we started out by defining what love is. Love is patient, love is kind. Love does not keep account of a wrong suffered. And then he says, well then we go to John, and John says, Beloved, let us love one another. Love is from God. And everyone who loves is born of God. Everyone who loves is born of God. Okay? Tell me somebody who doesn't love. Well, but even he was born of God. Okay. All right. Um, but everybody, in some way, shape, or form, because even Satan loves himself. Satan loves chaos. Satan loves destruction. Right? And, but Satan was also born of God. Well, yeah. It's, I mean, it's two words mean the same thing. Okay, but anyway, we've all been born of God. So the seed doesn't go into the ground and sprout and fertilize and become alive. We just call it a different thing, but it's the same thing. A seed goes into a woman, fertilizes an egg, and then it sprouts into a person, and we say that person is born. A chicken goes into an egg, and we say that chicken hatches, but it's still the same thing. 
you still were not, there was, there was still not life, and now there is life. Something came to life. <laughs> it can be created, or it can be born, or it can be hatched, or it can be whatever. <laughs> We're getting off on rabbit trails already. Okay? Um, Sorry, Jerry, you're upset with me. <laughs> Somebody's trying to get my job. <laughs> Setting people straight, that's what I do. Um, anyway, alright, so. Um, then he says in verse 8 here, John says, The one who does not love does not know God. For God is love. So God is love. So then, if we go back to 1 Corinthians 13, we can begin to read that a little bit differently. Because if 1 John 4, 8 is, or 4, 9 is true and God is love, then we can reword 1 Corinthians 13. And we can say, God is patient. God is kind. God is not jealous and does not brag. God is not arrogant and does not act unbecomingly. God does not seek his own. He is not provoked. He does not, God does not take into account a wrong suffered. God does not rejoice in unrighteousness, but rejoices with truth. God bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. God never fails. Because God is love. And so if those things are true about love, they're true about God. Because God is love. Okay, so then when we go back here to 1 John. He says, let us love one another. Okay, he starts there. And he says, in this is love, verse 10, not that we loved God. But that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. But, beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. God does not love us, so we will love him. God loves us to teach us how to love each other. That's what it's about. And then, then these, there's so many just little nuggets in here. I love these little nuggets. Okay? When he talks about propitiation, because we always talk about, you know, we talk to just to touch briefly on substitutionary atonement. If Jesus is a propitiation, he cannot be a substitute. A propitiation is just a gift. I'm going to do this for you for no reason, except that I love you. A substitute is, you're going to get it, so I'm going to do it for you instead of you doing it. A propitiation cannot be a substitute. They're mutually exclusive. But then he also says this other thing. Um, he sent his only begotten son into the world so that we might live through him. Now, once again, we've talked about this a lot. The point of Christianity is not going to heaven when you die. The point of Christianity is living the life that Jesus Christ called you to live and chose you to live before the foundation of the world. Ephesians 4. Before the foundation of the world, He chose you to be adopted as His son or as His daughter. So you were God's son or you were God's daughter. He adopted you before the foundation of the world. Before the foundation of the world, God puts you in Christ. This is when we've been talking about the cosmic Christ. You were never not in Christ. You just weren't always aware of being in Christ. And so he says, let us love one another. How can we love one another? If we don't first love us. Paul writes in Galatians 5, verse 14, he says, For the whole law is fulfilled in one word in the statement, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. And so many people will say, well, the one word that sums up the law is love. And so many other people say, well, the, whole, the one word is neighbor. But the one word that sums up the whole law is yourself. Because you can't love God, you can't love your neighbor, if you don't love you, 
Okay? And so this is where we get into Bernard of Clairvaux and his four degrees of love. First degree of love is you love you for you. Second degree of love is when you love God for you. Third degree of love, that says love, don't worry about it, is you love um, God for God. Fourth degree is you love you for God. Okay? And I've talked about this a lot, um, but it's important. Okay? So first degree of love, you love you for you. Everything you do, you don't care what it does to anybody else as long as you benefit from it, as long as it makes you happy, as long as it gives you what you want, regardless of the consequences for people around you, you will do it. Because the only reason you do anything is for you. Okay? Two is you love God for you. You will love God you will serve God. You will go to church. You will do all the godly stuff as long as you're benefiting from it. As long as you get something out of it, you're going to do it. Third degree of love is when you love God for God. You serve God. You sacrifice for God. You spend your life ministering to people and trying to help people come to God. And you, and you love God. And so therefore, out of your love for God, you serve God. And you worship God. And God benefits because people come in contact with you and their life is changed because of your service unto God. And that's a pretty good place to be. Right? But that fourth degree of love is when you love you for God. When you can stand before the mirror and when you look in the mirror you don't see a spot or a wrinkle you see the exact image that God sees when he sees you. Because when God looks at you, he doesn't see your spots and wrinkles. He doesn't see your, your, your pain. He doesn't see your sin. He sees the image that he created you to be in. And then, and then but, but, but once again, <laughs> we spend so much of our time listening to the chickens telling us that we're seed. Telling us that we're, we're sinners. And, and we, we allow Satan to fill our head with shame. He fills our head with guilt. And he fills our head with, with fear. Right? And so when we look into a mirror, we see all the things that we're ashamed of. We see all of our guilt. We see all of our fears. We see all the condemnation that the world has put on us. That we can't see us as who we are in God's eyes. And therefore, how can I love that guy? Listen, I know what goes on in my mind. I know the things that I've done. I'm a pretty hard guy to love. And, and most people don't even know what goes on in my mind and they find I'm a hard guy to love. I know I'm difficult to love because I know more about me than you do. But I know where those things come from. And they don't come from God. And so when I can begin to love me... I can begin to love you. When I can begin to love me, I can begin to love God. And when I stand before and I look in that mirror completely naked, and I don't see a spot or a wrinkle, and I see the exact image that I was created in, and I fall in love with that person, because that person is a son who was adopted by his father. Before the foundation of the world, that person in that mirror was chosen by God to do things. That person is amazing. That person is loved by his creator. And then how can I, as someone, I love God for God already, but when I look in that mirror and I can't see me the same way God sees me, how can I not love what God loves? How can I not see what God sees? The problem is many. Because I get so filled as a human being living in the world, I get so filled with shame and guilt and fear that then I project all that back onto you. I see everything about you that I hate about myself. And then I see for me now I can hate you. And I can hate Milo because when I look at Milo, all I see is every way in which he is like me. And I see in him all the things I hate about myself, so now I can hate you. Brian Zahn, he wrote a book, well he wrote several books, 
the one I've highly recommended to a lot of people. I don't know if anybody's ready yet. Um, um, children in the hands of a loving God or sinners in the hands of a loving God. Children in the hands of a loving Father. So I, I literally, I recommend this book every single day and now I can't remember the title of it. Oh my gosh. But anyway, one, there, and one of the things he says in that, in, that, in that book, he says an enemy is only somebody whose story you haven't heard. And so we can, we can hear about a guy named Josh, and we can hear about the things that he's done, and we can say, oh, he's a criminal, he got what he deserves. You know what I mean? He made his own choices. Because once again, remember, if you're 17 and you commit a crime, it's because you have bad parents. But when you're 18 you commit a crime, it's because you didn't know any better. Right? That, that one day, <laughs> you know, and that one day from turning 17 to 18, now you've learned right from wrong, and now you know better, so now we're going to send you to big boy jail. But when you're 17, it's, it's okay. They, they have a bad upbringing. Right? So, um, but we can hear all about his story now that he's over 18, and it's all his fault. Well, he got what he deserved. You know what I mean? Why should I have sympathy for him? He's the one who messed up his life. But then we bring him up, and you listen to his story. You hear his heart. It's a lot easier to love that guy then. Right? It's a lot easy to see him as a child of God when he's talking about how he ended up being who he was. And how it wasn't his fault. It was his father's fault. But it wasn't his father's fault. It was his grandma's fault. But it wasn't his grandma's fault. It was whoever made her that way. And whoever made that person that way. And now we go all the way back to the stupid tree. Because that's where it all started. Right? But the point is, is that if I can now look at you... And I see in you what I see in me that makes me love me. And when I see Milo, I look at, he's a son of God, just like I am. Before the foundation of the world, God chose him. Before the foundation of the world, God adopted him. Wait, he did that for me too. And now I'm not going to say, well, I guess I'm not special. I'm going to say, I guess Milo's special too. We're all special. And now I can begin to love him the same way God loves me. And guess what happens when all of us begin loving each other the same way God loves us? God benefits. When his creation begins living in the love in which we were created to live in, when his creation begins to live the life that Christ came to give us to live, God's going to benefit because he's going to begin to reclaim his territory that was stolen from him in the garden. His kingdom is going to begin to grow. And how do we do that? We love one another. We don't love God. I mean, I know. <laughs> we do love God. Okay. But we don't, we, God, we don't just love God because God loves us. God loves me, and so I'm going to love him back. And then God loves you, so you love him back. And, and if everybody just loves God back, what do you have? You have a bunch of individuals. Once again, God did not call us to live individually. God called us to live communally. God called us to be in fellowship. God called us to be in unity. John 17, Jesus prays for us to be one just as they are one. I in them, them in me, I in you, you in me. We're after unity. We're after a oneness that's only possible when we first love ourselves, so we can love each other. Because I've been there. I was there for a brief period of time. I spent a lot of time here. But this is where I want to be. And that's where I hope I am. Because just ask me about me, I'll tell you how great I am. I'm not going to tell you about my flaws because I don't have any. Why don't I have any flaws? Because I refuse to look at them. I don't want to acknowledge my flaws. I'm not going to talk. I want to make myself feel ashamed. Let's, let's look at what I'm doing right. Let's look who I am, who God created me to be. Because God didn't create me with a flaw. He made me perfect. The world is what messed that image up. 
I spent the first 25 years of my life being created in the image of the world after I'd already been created in the image of God. So I spent the rest of my life undoing that image. I am not who the world says I am. I'm not a piece of seed laying on the ground. I don't care what the chickens think. I'm a son of God. And then so when we begin to understand our relationship with God, we begin to understand what love is. How do we live out that love? Who is God? God being love, right? So what does that mean? God is not up there with a checklist with a bunch of boxes he's waiting to check off. Oh, Bonnie messed up that time. She's done. Wait, oh, she messed up again. Oh, she messed up again. Three strikes, she's out. No more Bonnie. She's, she's eternally damned. Can't have nothing to do with her anymore. Oh, look, she's still messing up again and again. Done with that. Like he's literally up there with a check mark or check mark or a check box and waiting waiting for us to screw up. And the problem is people actually believe this about God. They they believe this God is true. And and so one of the things that we, we gotta realize is that God is love. God does not want us to mess up so he can punish us. And so when we stop thinking about God, oh let me see if I can draw it this week. No, I already messed it up. Right? When we start thinking about the perichoresis, the dance, God is not a noun. He's not a thing. He's action. He's movement. Right? And so when we stop thinking about God as the noun, and then we think of sin as the verb. Sin is our action. Sin is what I do. No. Sin is the noun. Sin is the thing that is inside of us that gets us to do what we do. And so God, as the verb, God is not coming into our life to punish us of our sin. God is coming into our life to heal us of our sin. And that's the only thing he's ever wanted us to do is stop believing the lie. Sin is the lie. The lie that you tell yourself it's okay to steal or it's okay to look at that or it's okay to do that. Don't worry about it. You've already separated yourself from God anyway. You're already a sinner. You're already going to hell. Just keep doing what you're doing. That's all a lie. And Jesus Christ came into the world to undo the lie. So we stop believing all the nonsense the world tells us about ourselves. We stop listening to the sin. We stop trying to follow a, a checklist of behaviors that we need to do to earn God's favor. Because when we read 1 Corinthians 13, nothing there is about being earned. Love is not something that needs to be earned. It's a free gift. I don't love you because you do anything for me. I love you because I want to be centered and focused on giving of myself for you. Not because I get anything in return. That's not love. When I hear people, well, I love this person. Why do you love them? Well, because of all the stuff they give to me. So you don't really love them. You just love that they love you. When I hear somebody talk about, why do you love your wife? Because she lets me do this for her. She lets me do that for her. She lets me do this. She lets me do that. That's what love is. Love is what you can do for somebody else, not what they do for you. And so my job as a pastor is to love people. I mean, you know, I don't don't get a whole lot out of it. (laughs) But the ability to love people. And when you take somebody who comes from the world... When you take somebody who's so filled with hate, as I was, you take somebody who is so listening to all the chickens, all you are is an addict, all you are is a drunk, all you are is a loser, all you are is a hateful, angry human being. You're not going to be anything else. And then one day, my job is just to love a whole group of people for no reason. Like, that journey to get from this person to who I am today... That's a miracle. I mean, that's somebody who has, who, 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 who's missing a leg, and we come on stage and we pray for him, and a new leg grows right in front of our face. That same type of miracle is my life. It is your life. It's Josh's life. It's Ann's life. When we all listen to our stories, Karen shared her story. Phil's story. 
The fact that Phil can go through what he went through with his daughter, but yet he still trusts God. He's still here. That's a miracle. He doesn't know what Jerry's gone through or where he's been. And the fact that he's still here, it's a miracle. But we don't celebrate these miracles because they're not miracles we see. We didn't see a leg grow out of a stump. But the fact that we're here today, living the life, being able to love somebody else strictly because I'm supposed to, simply because I want, I'm not get rid of the supposed to, because I want to love you, that's a miracle. That we can go through what we've gone through and still be able to give of ourselves and focus on somebody else. And that's what we're called to do. We're called to love one another. So let's let us love one another. But first of all, let's let us love ourselves. Let's let ourselves off the hook for all the crap we've done in our life, for all the pain that we've caused other people. For all the dark thoughts that have run through our mind. I said, off the hook of it. I still get them. Trust me, you're going to be in this job and have some dark thoughts from time to time. It's hard. But I don't, I don't, that thought doesn't come in my head. I don't judge myself for that thought. I say, get out of my mind and say, I ain't listening to you. Where's that other thought that says that person needs to be loved? Where's the other thought that says how much, how much that person means to me? Simply, because they exist. Right now we have an entire community of people who their entire purpose of waking up today, from the moment they woke up today, the only thing that they had, their own entire purpose, was just to get enough money to put a needle in their arm. And then once they've gotten enough money to put a needle in their arm, the whole process starts over again. You know what we're supposed to do? We're supposed to love them. Just because they exist. And we love them with the needle in their arm. We love them. Because God loves me. Thankfully, I never stuck a needle in my arm. Got pretty close. But even in my darkest hour, he still loved me. He never gave up on me. He never changed his mind about me. Before the foundation of the world, I was his son. And there's nothing that could have ever changed that. And he was willing to give and give and give and give. And I just kept taking and taking and taking. But yet he never gave up. And now he gives and I take and I give right back. Give and I take, give and I take. And I take. Because that's what we're called to do. We're called to love one another. And so yeah, I want us to, to begin to understand what love is. And when you, when you read that 1 Corinthians 13, I want, you to, I want you to place love with God because God is love. Love is not a noun. Love is an action. God is not a noun. God is a dance. He is an action. And allow Him to be that in your life. Everything you do, every person you come in contact with, you look at them and you see that person as God. You know, last week, I got to go to the prison... And there was a skit. These guys, they do these skits. And these skits are phenomenal. These skits are great. And so there's this guy. He's, he's in this skit. And he's sitting down. And he's sitting at this bench. And he's trying to read his Bible. And this really obnoxious guy comes and sits down next to him. And he has a bag of chips. And he's crinkling the bag of chips. He's got his headphones on. His music is blaring. He's crunching on the chips. And he goes, do you mind? I'm, I'm trying to study my Bible. He says, oh, man, I'm sorry, man. I'm sorry, you know. And next thing you know, he taps on the door. So what are you reading? Reading the Bible. Is that a good book? You know, and he just kept irritating and irritating and irritating him. And, and finally the guy says, all right, man, fine. I guess I'll just leave you alone. And the guy says, and the guy goes, all right, well, what was your name again? He goes, Jesus. And he just walked away. All right? And so if we see every annoying person in our life, and if we see them as Jesus, is that going to change the way we, we, we treat that person? Because where is Jesus? He's inside of that person. So when you are sitting down to that really obnoxious person, you are sitting down next to Christ. Because Christ is in him. Or her. Christ is in women too, Karen, in case you didn't know. It's not just men. Sometimes people get confused. You know, our, our gender-specific language confuses people. 
you know, the Bible says that you know, we were created or we were adopted as sons. Does that mean women are left out? Or do women do you have to become sons now? I don't get it. Um, no, it's just the language. We're all included. So if I can begin to see you and I see you in the image of God. I see you as Christ. I see you. You know, whatever, however you want to talk about the Holy Spirit, whatever. If that's the way I see you, just imagine how much it's going to change the way I treat you. How I talk about you. How I talk to you. Because I've learned to love. Because God loved me. Then I began to love me. And then I began to love you. And then God wreaked all the benefit from it. Because his children began to love each other. And my kids, they don't always get along. And I'm sure they're not always going to get along. But when I see my kids sitting on the couch and they're watching a movie together and they're snuggling together, like they wanted to have sleepovers this weekend. So you know, I built a fort in Jimmy's room a couple weeks ago. And so yesterday, or Friday night, they wanted to have a sleepover in the fort. And they just laid in the fort and cuddled together all night long. And when you see your kids loving each other, it's just amazing. Now, when they're fighting and screaming, and screaming at each other, it's a little different story. But I can only imagine what God sees when he sees us loving on each other. The joy that comes into his heart when he sees his children loving each other. Because I know what happens in my heart when I see my kids loving each other. Let us love one another. Let us remove hate. Let us be the people that God called us to be before the foundation of the world. Amen.